Generally speaking, you know, we as human beings, uh, we, we kind of like to talk about ourselves, don't we? Uh, do you know somebody that likes to talk about them? Now, don't point at anybody here. But, um, you know, if, if you think about it, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I think that, that um, Facebook is, is so popular as a part of our social media is because it gives people an opportunity to talk about themselves, doesn't it? I mean, that's kind of the way that works. I mean, I know that Facebook does a lot of good things, and for us, that's kind of the way we keep up with our grandkids. We see pictures and watch them grow and all that kind of stuff because they don't live here locally. So I know that it does a lot of things, but, you know, that is kind of one of the things that Facebook does. It, it, it allows people to communicate uh, about themselves with others. Uh, you know, we do that in other ways in our, our society. You know, a resume, everybody knows what a resume is, I think. Uh, you know, when you make out a resume, what are you trying to do in your resume? You're trying to communicate to a future employer who you are, right? And uh, so we, we try and put our best foot forward, uh, perhaps, uh, and uh, let them know what our skills are and our strengths are and that kind of thing. But, you know, having, having been on the other side of, of the resume situation, having received resumes and trying to hire people, you come to a realization that sometimes a person can look really good on paper, uh, but not so much in person. And, you know, the same can be true with regards to Facebook. I think all of us are aware of the fact that a person can very easily misrepresent themselves, and how they appear on Facebook and who they really are can be something very different. Amen or oh me. So we see that uh, in these two areas... Uh, we see very clearly that we, we kind of like to tell people what we're like. But you know what we typically do is we tell people what we think we are as opposed to what we really are. Uh, we're continuing here in the end of our year to uh, undergird the theme of bridging the gaps. And, and here at the very end of the year here, we're looking at the gap that can be present within the life of a believer as far as their relationship with Jesus Christ and how they understand the world. In other words, we're trying to help, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to allow the Bible to help us develop a Christian worldview. You see, I recognize that there are people who are very much in a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've surrendered their life to Christ, but they struggle with understanding the world from a Christian perspective. They have difficulty understanding all that takes place around them without using uh, worldly ways of doing that. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we have a biblical Christian worldview as believers so that we can understand the world as God intends us to do so. So this morning's sermon is titled, uh, Who Do You Think You Are? Now, I'm not using it in the way that sometimes that's used, okay? Have you ever heard somebody come up to somebody and say, just who do you think you are? We're not, not using it like that. I'm, I'm using it as a way to simply say, uh, or to ask the question, do we truly understand who we are? Do we truly understand what makes us, us? Now, you know as well as I do that people use all kinds of different ways to describe themselves or to understand themselves. Uh, let's put this in a very common situation. I'm sure you've been in a situation before where you've met someone for the very first time, and while you're standing there or sitting there talking with them, inevitably the question is asked, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Have you ever been in that situation? Uh, someone has asked you that, maybe they, you've asked them that question. You know, people can answer that in a lot of different ways if you think about it. You know, a person could say in that scenario, when, when they're asked, tell me a little bit about yourself, they could say, well, I'm a Democrat. Or they could say, I'm a Republican. Or they could say, I'm an Independent. Or any other kinds of ways to classify yourself politically. You know, a person could say it that way. Or if you were to ask someone, tell me a little bit about yourself, they could say, well, uh, I'm married and I have three kids and uh, we live in such and such place. You know, they're, what are they doing? They're describing themselves relationally, right? You know, the most common way that we uh, view ourselves is vocationally. I'm sure all of us in here have met someone and inevitably you've said, tell me about yourself. And they, they will say something to the effect of, well, I am a police officer or I'm an executive, or I work in a factory, or something like that. They're understanding themselves from a very specific perspective. Everybody with me? Nod your head if you're with me. Okay, all right. All right. Now, here's the transition. 
All of those things are right and good and fine, but understanding ourselves biblically is what's most important. Uh, this leads us to say something that's going to really uh, guide us throughout the remainder of our time together. So we're going to put it up here on the board here so that you can look at that and think about it here for a few moments. You see, understanding ourselves biblically leads to the same conclusion for everyone. We need a Savior. Listen, I'm not saying that all those other things are wrong or false. You know, you can understand yourself as a police officer or you can understand yourself as a member of a family or, or politically or any other kind of way you want to identify yourself. But what we are saying is that understanding ourselves biblically is foundational to understanding who you truly are. So if that's the truth, and I believe it is the truth, then we need to go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about us. So that it can help us know who we think we are. And that will kind of make your head spin a little bit. Uh, this is what I want us to, to do here. Uh, I hope you have your Bible. We're going to do a little traveling here. So get your Bibles out. Uh, we want to go to God's Word and see what it has to say about ourselves and who we are. And so let's start at the beginning, all right? Let's just go to the book of Genesis. Open your Bibles to Genesis. Go to the first chapter and go to verses 26 and 27. It's here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we see this truth being given to us about ourselves. We are created in God's image. That's what these verses tell us. You've seen it before, but let's look at it together. Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now you can't look at that without seeing that, first of all, there were some things that were repeated there. And one of the things that was repeated was humanity, mankind, was made in the image of God. It tells us that over and over again. I don't know if you heard about the story of the little girl that went to her mother and, and, and said, Mom, can you tell me where the human race originated from? And she said, well, honey, it's pretty simple. She said, God created Adam and Eve, and they had children, and, and from that, all of humanity came into existence. And that satisfied her, but a couple of days later, she was with her dad, and she said, ask him the same question. Dad, can you tell me, how did the human race originate? And dad said, well, you know, a long time ago, there was a bunch of monkeys, and eventually those monkeys evolved into the, the human race. Well, now this little girl was a little bit confused, as you can imagine. So she went back to her mom, and she said, now, mom, how can this be? How can it be that dad says that they came from monkeys, we came from monkeys, and you say it was from God and Adam and Eve? And her mother, not upset at all, said this. She said, honey, listen. I was telling you about my side of the family. He, he was telling you about his side of the family. So I won't ask which side of the family you're on. No, obviously, listen. The Bible makes it very clear. There was no evolution. Humanity, mankind, is the apex of God's creative process. He created all these other things, but then he said, look, I'm going to wow you and show you what I can really do. And he created man. And what is significant about that is it said at least twice there, and he created us in his image. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean there were all little gods like the New Age philosophy tells us? No. It does mean, though, that we share some characteristics that God has. And this is extremely important in understanding who we are. So when we hear this phrase that we're created in God's image, we need to unpack that a little bit. And there's a lot of things that we can say. I'm just going to mention three important things that, th that this means, but there's some other things that it means as well. But first and foremost, one of the things that it means to say that we are created in God's image is that human beings are persons. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, duh. I mean, I mean, doesn't that just the two go together? Well, it does, but if you'll just think about it for a moment, we're saying something very specific when we say that human beings are persons. In other words, none of us are robots. None of us are just a blob of cells or flesh. We are aware of our existence. We know we exist. 
And not only that, we share characteristics that make us distinctly individual people. You are a person. The person next to you is a person. These folks up here, these are persons. They have the awareness of their existence. They have distinct qualities that make them individuals. Now, why is that important? Because God is the same way. God is a very distinct person. He has very specific qualities and aspects of his existence. So do we. So part of what we're saying here is simply this. God is a person and so are we. That's part of what it means to be made in his image. But something else we want to say here is that persons are a unity. In other words, you as a person, you are physical, but you are also mental, you are also emotional, and you are also spiritual. And what we're saying here is that this is a unity that cannot be separated. In other words, understanding who you are, you cannot simply understand yourself as a physical being. You also must ha understand yourself as an emotional being and a mental being. And yes, even though what the atheists may say that this is not true, you are even a spiritual being. You have the potential to be that. Now, the importance of this is that, again, this is what we share with God. God is a person, and in him there is completeness. There is unity. You cannot separate characteristics of God uh, and, and put them out there and say, this is God, but this characteristic of God is not God. God is a unity. When we say God is love, we mean that God is love all the time. When we understand that God is a compassionate God, when he is a gracious God, we can't separate that from also the fact in knowing that God is a God who is just. He is a complete person. And what that is saying to you and to me is that we can be a complete person as well. Finally, we would also say that being created in God's image means that we are created free. We can make decisions, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, we have been created with the ability to make decisions. God is the same way. God has the ability to think and to make decisions. And we share that characteristic with him. Now let's take that a step for, further because this will help me uh, in what I'm about to say later. Not only can God make decisions, but God always makes right decisions. Amen? And that tells us that while we are not God, we have the potential... To make right decisions too. So what have we said so far? We've said we're created in God's image. And that means that in the very beginning, God had some great things in store for humanity. He wanted us to be a person, an individual, to be distinct in our existence and to be able to make good rational decisions and to experience all that life that he had created had available for us. That sounds pretty good. But you know, the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible says something else about us that we need to see, something very important. Now we're going to the New Testament. And so you'll need to go over to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3, because it's here that we see a very important truth that the Bible gives us. And that is this. We've allowed sin to corrupt his image. We've allowed sin to to corrupt the image that we've been created in. And Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3, kind of helps us see this. It doesn't jump right out at us, but if you'll let me unpack it just a little bit, we'll see very clearly that this is helping us to understand something very important about ourselves. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says this about them. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the atmospheric domain, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and by nature we were children under wrath as the others were also. Man, there's a lot in there, but if you'll let me just pull out a few things. One of the things that it's saying there in the first verse, it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What have we just learned? Hey, we were created in God's image. That, and if you think about that, that means life, and it means life abundant. But what has happened? Sin has worked its way into our lives, and it has created deadness, if you will. That's what sin does. And not only does Paul speak about them in that way, but look at verse 3. 
He says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. Paul is saying, it's not just you, church, in Ephesus. He's saying, all of us have come under that curse of sin. You see what he says after that, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and by nature, look at that phrase, by nature we were children under wrath as others were also. What this is saying to us is that the image we've been created in, God's image, has been marred, corrupted by sin. And that sin exists in all of us. You know, if we go back to the Genesis story, and you know this to be true, just hitting the highlights, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And that inclination to sin has been passed down to all of us. We all have that. Every one of us has that inclination to sin. We call that a sinful nature. This nature that Paul was talking about right here. That by nature we were children under wrath. And we all have it. I don't know if you've heard of the story of the pastor in a church that, uh, well this pastor, he thought very highly of himself. Uh, he was what you might call kind of pompous. Do you, are you familiar with that word? You know, And uh, you know, and, and everybody in the church pretty much knew that that was kind of the way he was. He, he just really felt like he walked on water. Uh, and, uh, but one Sunday morning, he was asked to be a substitute teacher for the young boys' class. And, and he was trying to impress upon them how important it is to live the Christian life. And that's a good thing to do. And so he started out by doing this. He, he got in front of the class and he, you know, he shot his sleeves and he adjusted his tie and he adjusted his glasses, and he looked at them in this very uh, authoritative way, and he said with one of those voices that kind of just drips of, uh, of uh, self-pride, Now, boys, why do you think that people call me a Christian? And there was a pause, and then a little fellow in the back said, Well, maybe they don't really know you. Well, you know, he may have something there. Listen, uh, every, I don't care what office we hold in church. I don't care how, how long we've been a Christian. That sinful nature is present there. Now listen, when we, and we're going to get to this in a few moments, when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, that nature is now under the dominion of God. And when we die, when we are, go to be with him for all of eternity, that sinful nature is totally obliterated. But... While we're here in this flesh, we have that inclination towards sin, and we all have it. Now, I don't know about you all, but I've met folks uh, that, based upon the way they talk and the way they conduct themselves, they, they really do believe that they don't ever do anything wrong. Now, don't elbow anybody or anything like that, but have you met people like that? I mean, they, 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 they don't think they ever do anything wrong. They never make a mistake. And if they have, if it ever looks like maybe they did make a mistake, they've got an excuse. They, they say, that happened and that made me do it. You know those kind of people? And they've got an excuse, they've got a reason for the mistakes that they've made. It's not their fault. Something made them do it. Now listen, folks, what we have to recognize is that while we can see this in people, and maybe even in people that we love... And we can also see it working out in our societal issues that are facing us today, and we won't go any further than that. When a person refuses to accept the truth that the Bible tells us, that we all make mistakes, that we all sin, that is a serious problem. It is a serious rejection of the truth. And it's very simple. You see, if you've never, ever done anything wrong then you don't need a Savior, do you? Right? If you've never done anything wrong, you, I mean, you don't need a Savior. There's nothing that you need to be rescued from. But folks, that's not true. That's not even anywhere close to the truth. Listen, we, Terry and I, we had three boys. We saw them growing up. We didn't have to teach them to do evil things. They just did it. Not just that you're here and I'm picking on you today, but, and I won't give any examples that will embarrass you. But listen, you're welcome. 
We know from the very beginning that when these kids show up on the planet, they have two things that they're trying to satisfy. They're hungry and they want to do something wrong. And, and that is just what happens. Everybody then must recognize that that sinful nature is something that is a prevailing sinful nature that unless is checked in some kind of way, condemns us for all of eternity. The sin that has corrupted the image of God is also an agent that will cause our own destruction for all of eternity. You see, we've got to recognize that this is a part of who we are. Because again, if you don't recognize that there is sin in your life, if you don't realize that that has separated you from God, if you don't recognize that that sin will require a price and that you will pay it unless someone else does, and that price is death, then you have no reason to consider needing a Savior. But the Bible says otherwise. And that leads us to perhaps the most important thing we want to see here from God's Word that talks to us about us. Here's this final truth we want to look at. We can be a new creation in Christ. We can be a new creation in Christ. We find this in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. So if you've got your Bibles, go there real quickly. The second, uh, 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. This is a fairly familiar passage of Scripture, but let's look at it in depth here. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Man, a new creation, that sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, I know that there are some of us here today that, that, that would say from a physical standpoint, yeah, man, I would love to have some new things. I'd love to have some new knees or some new hips or new eyes and that kind of thing. But folks, it's not talking about a spiritual uh, transformation. I mean, a, a physical transformation. It's talking about a spiritual transformation. Now, it says that when we are in Christ, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, that's when this new creation comes to be. Now, it doesn't mean that when you're in Christ that you become something that nobody else has ever become. No, when you are in Christ, everyone pretty much follows the same pattern here. And, and the rest of the verse really kind of tells us what that is. This is something, this new creation, while it's something that will happen that's new in your life, it does take a fairly predictable path. Let's see what the rest of the verse says. It says... If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Now look at how it describes that. Old things have passed away. Folks, that refers to your old way of living. Old things have passed away. In other words, the way that you used to live your life, that's gone. It's vanished. It's history. When you used to pursue sin, you no longer do that. This old way of thinking this old way of interacting with people, th these old ways of, of categorizing people and these old tools that you use to get through life, all of those things have been wiped off the table. And not only that, it says, and look, new things have come. When you're in Christ, you have a new reference point for life. In other words, and this is what we're really after here with this series, you begin to interpret life from the perspective that you are a new person in Jesus Christ. You're no longer interpreting life as a police officer or working in an office building. You encounter people first and foremost and understand them through the lens of Christ. New things have come your way. A new way of living. A new reference point. You no longer are pursuing sin. You're pursuing Christ and who he is to you and what he's done for you and how you can better serve him. You see, in Christ, sin no longer dominates you. What now dominates you is your relationship with the one 
who died for you. Now, a few moments ago, I said, unless that sinful nature is not checked, unless a price has been paid, it will exact a price in your life, and that price is death. But the good news of the Bible is that Jesus paid the price for your and my sin. Amen? He died on the cross in your place and in my place, not because I deserved it, not because I was worth it, but because he loved me and wanted me to experience eternal life with him. He paid the price for my sin so that I could receive the gift of eternal life. Now, that didn't happen to me automatically. It didn't happen to you automatically if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. To be in Christ means we make a decision. Do you remember we went back to... Let's go back to what we said, we, who we are as an, in, in the image of Christ. We can make good decisions. That's part of what it means to be in the image of Christ. And folks, for us to be in Christ, it means making a good decision. Now let's be very clear. That decision to be in Christ is to surrender everything and put ourselves under the submission of Jesus Christ. When we become a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not like hitting the like button on Facebook. I, I'm not a Facebook person, but I know that people can post things up there, and if you like it, you can hit the like icon, and they collect all these likes, and you get 5,892 likes, right? It's not like that. Being in Christ is not like it is on Facebook, saying, will you be my friend, and they accept your friend invitation, and now you've got 5,283 friends. To be in Christ means that you have immersed your life in Him. That you have lost your own identity as to how you interpret the world, what's important to you, your value systems. All of that has changed and now you are under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ who died on the cross because he loves you. You know, the Bible tells us very plainly that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what it means to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I recognize that maybe there's some people here today that are saying, Brother Robbie, I, I want to believe that. I, I, I'm, I'm, there's a part of me that's hoping that that's true. But Brother Robbie, you just don't understand how corrupted God's image became in my life. You just don't realize how many sinful things have taken place in my life. You don't realize how far I've gotten away from God. You don't realize that where I stand right now, Brother Robbie, it appears as if I am irretrievable and unsavable. I don't know if this will help at all, but I just want you to listen very carefully to these next few statements. I am convinced in the, my heart of hearts, that there is no life so deeply stained with sin that he cannot make it white as snow. I am convinced that there is no addiction so great that he cannot break it. I am convinced that no one is so lost that he cannot find them. I believe that there is no one so spiritually sick that he cannot heal them. His love is greater than your rebellion. His mercy is greater than your guilt. And his grace is greater than your sin. So the good news is, yes, we're created in his image. Sin has marred that image, but God made a way for us to be created new again if we'll simply place our faith in Him. You see, folks, at this point now, it all boils down to who you think you are. Maybe you heard this story. There was a woman who showed up one, at one of the mega churches. You know what a mega church is. You know, it's, it's a huge complex. You know, this particular church, it, the sanctuary seated 20,000 people, you know. And, and, you know, they were geared up. They were ready. This church, they've, they've been doing this for a long time. So this woman, when she stepped onto the campus and when she went through that set of doors, there was an usher right there to, to greet her. 
And, and uh, he began to escort her to the sanctuary. And as they were going there, he said, ma'am, ma where would you like to sit? She said, I'd like to sit on the front row. A and the usher thought for a moment, he said, I'm, I think I'm going to have to tell her the truth. So he said to her, ma'am, uh, I love our pastor, uh, but, but he's the most boring person I've ever heard. He is as dry as the Sahara <laughs> Desert. You, you don't want to sit on the front row. She looked at him and said, young man, do you know who I am? He said, no. She said, I am the pastor's wife. <laughs> he thought for a moment and looked at her. He said, do you know who I am? She says, I do not. He said, good. And he ran away. <laughs> so I guess knowing who we really are is important. Now, I don't know who you think you are, and I'm not meaning that in a bad way, but God knows who you really are. And this is what he knows about each and every one of us, that we all need a Savior. Is that who you are now this morning? You know, it could be that you came onto this campus thinking that this is who you are, but now you understand that this is who you are, in need of a Savior. I'm going to ask if you would please to stand. This is a time in our service where we invite you to make a decision based upon what God has said to you here today. Let me simply ask you this question. Do you recognize today that who you are is best defined by this statement? Someone who needs a Savior? Is that who you are? If you're here today and you realize that's me, I need a Savior because of the sin in my life. First of all, I want you to know this, that every person in here who is a believer has come to that place in their life. They've had to recognize that there is sin in their life. And then they had to confess that. All of us know what that, that is like, and there's no, there's no reason for you to be reluctant to do that. Because when you do that, the Bible says... That Jesus Christ enters our lives. He makes us a new creation. And there's no shame in being made new by Jesus. Is that who you are today? Listen, I realize we've got believers here today. Maybe you're a believer and you've, you've made a profession of faith and you're following Christ as best you can. But perhaps you've forgotten some of those things about who you truly are deep, deep down. You know, oftentimes it's, it's really easy for us to to highlight the fact that we're created in God's image and that God's initial idea with us was nothing but good. And we sometimes gloss over the fact that there's sin in our lives, even as believers. And maybe you need to come to this altar and simply ask the Lord to forgive you for allowing some things to pull you away from the side of Christ. Maybe you need to just come to this altar and pray and ask God to give you strength and courage for the time ahead, the week ahead. Or perhaps God is saying to you that this is the church that you need to be a part of. Maybe you need to join this fellowship and help us here to be light in the midst of this community. I'm simply asking that you respond to the voice of God in your heart and in your life.